Hello and welcome to another episode of Mysteries with a History, where I'll take, well, you'll be taken on a wild ride into the unknown, the strange, and the mysterious. Like you, I have questions, and like you, I want answers. There's more to this world than most think or believe. Mysteries that stretch back into murky epochs of time, a hint of other realms, other worlds, and other intelligences. We're on this journey together. With each episode, we will peel away the layers to look for the truth. For some, the topic of UFO sightings is a relatively a new phenomenon, but this is not the case, especially in terms of sightings during periods of war and military turmoil throughout history. UFO sightings were logged appearing over battlefields in the ancient past and also right up to the present day. In fact, the mysterious unidentified flying objects seem to pay particular attention to war zones. Why? Well, to help us better understand this topic, let me bring in my co-host, Jimmy Church of Fade the Black Radio. Jimmy, how is it going, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Hello, everybody. Happy holidays, Christina. Another amazing show uh, today. Very excited. Uh, great. Uh, you know, I say it every single week. You know, I don't know where uh, your mind goes. Um, I, 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 like, <laughs> I like every week. It's just like, you know, it, it, it's fresh. It's to the curb. And, it's, well, uh, you, you can no longer say it's to the curb without wearing a beanie. You have to wear a beanie and then oh, say that term. Okay, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. See, you, you caught me by surprise. My beanie is way over there, uh, I think. Hold on, hold on. Hold yeah, on. so as soon as you put on the beanie, then you can say your favorite line. Otherwise, it, it just doesn't okay. mush well together. All right, all right. It, 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 I was going to say I'll have to wait till after the break. but we There is no break. <laughs> I mean, this new intro of yours. It, Hi, it also took me. It also took me. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Let's go. Whoa. <laughs> uh, it was well all done. By well surprise. done. No, uh, thank you. The great, great uh, topic today. Let me um, let me say this. I'm, I'm extremely brief, but um, civilian aircraft. You know, if you you know you drive around, and more than likely wherever you live, you've got a small airport there. You know, with with or or, or you know bigger cities and and stuff, and and you see them flying around, and right. that's great. Okay, but uh, when it comes to uh, the military around the world, there is nobody more prepared if something is going on to get planes up. In, in the sky, there's that part, right? Radar and things. And they're looking for stuff to, to go and check out. So you have that part of it. And if you put your mind that way, think about the civilian airport. So you see something in the sky. What are you doing? Are you going to leave your house, you know, leave your job and drive to your airplane and fly? No, that, that stuff just doesn't happen. You may see something while you're flying, but the military is prepared. And then you uh, take things one step further and these theaters of conflict, right? Where all, everything is on, right? You're looking, you, you, that, that, that's what you do. And, and when you have aircraft in the air, aircraft ready to go into the air, you've got radar, you've got, but, but, but not what, what everybody's looking, right? And this is an environment to see stuff, and they do, and there are encounters. Now, we're, we're going to go back in history uh, tonight, too, as well. We're not just going to stay in, in these modern theaters of, of warfare. Uh, we're going to visit that, too, as well. But this isn't uh, something that just goes on today. It's been going on throughout history. So we're going to do all of that tonight, but just think about who is prepared and who is looking. And, and that's, that's the case. And we have got a lot of examples uh, uh, with the, if you move me left to right one more time, I might fall out of my chair, uh, by the way, I need to stay right here, but you're going to stay right there. Actually, like the power went out so fast that I got kicked out of Streamyard. Did you really? Yeah. 
It's Santa. It's mm. Santa. It's Santa. Why? It's... Why not Krampus? Oh, I have a Santa hat. Well, no, sure. that that that's not to the curb. That's, that's not to the... <laughs> oh man! All right. Oh, by the way, can I just uh, just do a little gloating uh, for a second? Only after you say Mark's last name the way you say it. Hey, Tasaka, Tasaka, today. Thank you so much, it's Mark. Aid to Black's ninth anniversary. <gasps> Yeah, yeah, straight up. And happy uh, anniversary. Yeah, we are now uh officially tomorrow. Uh but we're not on the air tomorrow. But uh tomorrow uh we are in our 10th year. Heck I've been yeah. I've been broadcasting uh since 2008, right? Jeez. But but this version of uh of, you know, my life and and what we're doing, uh we are now in our 10th year. Holy crap, right? Rock on. And Double your, digits, baby. So that's today. And I just wanted to uh, to say thank you to everybody. And, and thank you, uh, Christina, and and everybody for their support. And and hanging, putting up with us, putting up with me uh, for all this time. But we've got 10 more years to go. All right. So we'll we'll celebrate again in 10 years. And, and, and there's one other part to this anniversaries it's our sixth anniversary it's our fifth our sixth yeah you know okay all right this is your 1500th show this is you know uh these these occasions uh get rarer and rarer like the 1000th right. show well it's going to take another five six years to get to show number 2000 which you know will hit in a couple of years um and then the 10th anniversary or the 20th anniversary that's uh, 10 years from now. But for today, it's a pretty cool thing. So thank you to everybody. Rock on. No, that is that is some big news. And, you know, when and people may not know this because they, they don't podcast, but they listen to podcasts or shows or the radio coming up with that much content four days a week for 10 years, give or take, right? That's a lot of knowledge that is stored into your mind. And that's a big reason to why I love having you on this show in particular is that while I do hours, if not days of research, you've looked into so many of these topics over your 10 years of doing radio, of looking into the UFO phenomenon, that you just whip it out. And you're like, all right, I remember this. I, I spoke about this to my guests and things like that. And so I love this kind of dynamic that we have on this show where you bring in all of your previous knowledge while I bring in the books. Yeah, it's so true. And now this is where... Um, and I love the chemistry and I love what we do in our communication, certainly on and off the air, you know, just, just great conversations, but to your point, and this is how we segue into the show, but uh, let me, let me make this point really clear. Um, we're going to go back uh, deep into time and, and I hope that we can even go in a chronological order with everything that you have set up here. But when I was a kid, right, we, we're talking about you know, knowledge and stuff. Um, uh, I remember uh, opening up a couple of books. I'm in the fourth grade, Christina, right? I'm nine years old, eight years old and in the library and I'm in and I'm UFOs, right? They're, they're, they're my thing at that age. And, and I open up and I see uh, a few things and I read these historical stories. And one of them uh, was Alexander the Great. And I read this story and I read this account and I'm visualizing what, you know, this eight-year-old, nine-year-old brain, and I'm visualizing this account and what they were seeing and thinking about uh, what, what fascinated me at that time, uh, UFOs, space, the Apollo program, airplanes, rockets, the X-15, the Jetsons, whatever, and, and thinking they were seeing something, right? There was something in the sky back then, and that's, what, that's where the knowledge starts to come from because you go and you investigate all of this, and some of these things that uh, well, most of these subjects that we're going to talk about tonight, I've, I've researched for, for my life. Uh, I have a lifetime of interest here. 
Right. Um, and that's why today's show to me is is just so, so cool. So, so to the curb. You you can't say that without a beanie on, Jimmy. Like you you're that's gonna create it. a black hole. Yeah, that's it's it. It's illegal. Okay. Have to start, call the police. Start the show. I'll be back. All right. So probably one of the earliest encounters with UFOs being seen over a war zone area or where a battle will take place or has taken place was with Alexander the Great in 329 BCE. All of us remember as children when we looked into that one specific chapter all about Alexander the Great, and he accomplished some pretty incredible things in the short time period that he was doing all this exploration and conquering. Compared to other conquerors, he did a really uh, impressive job. And, well, in 329 BCE, he when he, he decided to invade India, he saw what his... Um, what he described as gleaming silver shields. Because we need to keep in mind that throughout the time periods, right, the definition of UFOs, not the definition, but the, I guess the explanation for UFOs changes over time when language evolves, when technology evolves. Like now, we're seeing these white little shaped ufos we call them tic tacs named after the tic tac mint but prior to that they could be called cigar shaped or wine jugs and during alexander's time he defined his shaped ufos as gleaming silver shields and this encounter is really interesting jimmy have you heard about it have I heard about it? I've dreamt about this. And and here's, okay, so let's stop right there. Let's do a little analysis on, on what you just said. Shields, flying shields, right? This, something was seen, Christina, to make that comment, flying shield. Now, does that sound like a, a triangle to you? Does that sound like an aircraft to you? Does that sound like some kind of flying mechanism? It's not a bird, right? No. It's not what what would have been seen 300 BC in 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 the sky. What what would have been seen? Clouds, the Nothing. sun. Right, right, right. Flying shields. And as a kid, you know, have I heard of, as a kid I'm picturing this, a silver shield right with a point on the front and a flat bob cruising through the sky and and for them to go and document this and make the account and put this into the historical record what were they seeing what were they seeing they were seeing a craft in the sky there's no question about it no i'm going to share my screen here as a visual aid for those that are visual learners here's alexander the great Dude. oh whoops my bad that was the wrong button. Here we go. Heart attack. Okay. I know, right? Like so bad. But so these gleaming silver shields had the effect of startling his horses, but also his enemy's horses as well, where they were just causing them to stampede incredibly. So when this was happening, it was very difficult to discover whose side these gleaming silver shields were on. But nonetheless, after exiting the battle victoriously, Alexander decided to not proceed any further into India. Seven years later, Alexander was confronted with the greatest challenge of his military career. In his attempt to conquer the Persian Empire, he realized that the city of Tyre needed to be captured in order to prevent the Persians from using that port to land an army behind him. But the original coastal city of Tyre had been destroyed before and had been rebuilt some distance offshore from its original site. So having no navy, Alexander decided to use the remains of the old city to build a causeway to the new one. In the historical account recorded by Alexander's chief historian, he states that during an attack on the island city, one of the two gleaming silver shields attacked a, a section of the wall with a beam of light, which subsequently caused that section of the wall to fall. 
Alexander's men pounded through the opening and captured the city. But what is so noteworthy about this particular encounter is the fact that the historians for the defeated people of Tyre reported the exact same reason for the loss of their city. Now, usually the reason given by defeated people is different than what is given by the victors, right? As my father always says, history is written by romanticists and it's also written by the winners as well. (laughs) But in this instance, their encounters read the same, where UFOs came down, they struck the wall, and Alexander won. It is when, um, when, when a description is being given, and especially when you don't have any point of reference to describe what you are seeing, you've never seen it before, and now you've got to put it into words. Um, uh, metallic gleaming shields emitting beams of light, right? That's how they described it. Which it does sound cool than flying saucers, to be honest with you, Jimmy. <laughs> you know, it, it's what they saw, you know, and they're trying to put it into words. Um, no matter, no matter what the explanations are for this. Um, the, the accounts of this have been repeated. Number one, number two, beams of light coming from the sky haven't happened officially until a hundred years ago. Right. That's it. That's it. That's it. We go back to, (laughs) we go back to, uh, Kitty Hawk and the Wright brothers and, and the beginning of flight that that's 1903. Right. That, that's it. That's it. There's nothing uh, in those 2000 years in between where somebody would have an ability to see something and go, that was like that other thing that we saw. Do you understand what I'm saying? That, that, that's it. There isn't another way. They, this was a first time uh, account. And the, the way that they have to describe it is what they saw. Right. That's right. Gleaming shields, beams of light. It's incredible. It is. So tell me what happened in Rome. There's there's a few encounters that happened there, and I would love to hear your side of the story. Okay. Okay. Uh, No, tell us about Rome, because there were a few things in Rome. Okay. So So we have this. Your favorite. uh, 74 BCE. Well, if no, let's stay with Rome. And uh, because before we jump to man. My personal favorite, Nuremberg. But before uh, we, yeah, before we jump to that, uh, tell us about Rome, and then because there are a few different events here. Well, I have one of them written down. It this happened in seventy four BCE. The Roman historian Plutarch. Am I saying that correctly? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Described reports from eyewitnesses in two opposing armies in the western part of what is now Turkey. And he wrote in one specific text text that says, but presently, as they were on the point of joining battle with no apparent change of weather, but all of a sudden the sky burst asunder and a huge flame-like body was seen to fall between the two armies. In shape, it was most like a wine jar and in color like molten silver. Both sides were astonished at the sight and separated. This marvel, as they say, occurred in Plagia at the place called Outre. Outre. Yeah. Yes. So that's a, a really interesting encounter that has been documented by the famous Roman historian. And there have been a few other accounts in Rome, but I, I find this one really compelling because this topic that we're doing today is UFOs seen over war zones. So Mm -hmm. we got to ask the big question, Jimmy, the one that everyone here is asking, why are UFOs being seen very specifically in those particular areas where battle is taking place or has taken place or will take place? Yeah. In this particular battle and this uh, account 
All right. Now, in and around Rome, uh, specifically, geographically, uh, there were other things that were happening. This happened in a battle uh, quite a distance away. And but in this battle, uh, which uh, and uh, I don't want to repeat myself. But when you look at this specific encounter, uh, it applies to everything in the historical record before modern photography and film and video. Uh, uh, what, what is in technology? What is it that they are seeing in the skies? So in this particular battle, um, over the years, I have, I've gone back and looked at uh, the very specific points in this. And the first one, um, which is the mercury, uh, you know, the liquid molten mercury uh, comment here. That says to me, chrome. Okay, so you're looking at uh, what is mercury? It's a very reflective, shiny. It's beautiful. Can't touch it. It'll kill you. But it's 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 romantic, right? You look at it. It is just uh, uh, something that causes the mind to go. People know what what mercury is and and how incredible it is to look at it's a liquid metal but to put this description on this i think of chrome they didn't have another way to describe it it's a mirror like surface and when we go back into the historical record now this is where we all need to just apply some thought here mirrors and the creation of a mirror was magical. That was a rare thing to have a to have a mirror in your possession. It's you were, romantic. Uh, if, if, well, very romantic, but you're also of, of a status. So no, how, it's it's a pun. Romantic. Area Fifty Juan wrote that, and I found it hilarious. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Yes. Anyway, hold on. Hold on. My my point being. That how did you see yourself? So you would polish surfaces, maybe silver, you know, something to polish a surface. Um, uh, glass would come into play. All of these were hard uh, materials to acquire if you're just a, a citizen, right? But you had to be of a certain stature. And then when you get to the description of mercury, you know, how, how, how does this come into play? And first things first is when you look at modern aircraft, um, and I could I could go through a list of names, but we've seen a lot of polished crafts, a lot of polished surfaces, chrome-plated materials, chrome-plated surfaces. And this is what was be, being described very elegantly, I might add, in this battle uh, on the border of Turkey. And there isn't any other... Uh, the thing that you can, how do I say this, you, uh, uh, in deduction and looking at this, what is it that they were seeing in the sky? There wasn't chrome. There wasn't polished aluminum. There wasn't polished titanium surfaces, uh, that, certainly uh, with aircraft flying around in the sky. But yet we have it here in this depiction that it was a craft shaped like a wine bottle covered in molten mercury. That is, that's insane to me. It's a uh, it's a mechanical craft flying in the air with a with a chrome plated surface. Incredible. It is nature cam. Thank you so much. By the way, she asks, did Alexander the Great ever see a vimana? Do you know any encounters that he did? And not, uh, vimana specifically from India. Now, is is it possible? Certainly. Yeah. yeah it, before we get uh, too sideways into this, um, vamanas are are something that, for me personally, every time I read the uh, accounts um, and the way that uh, they were described, and then the way that they were depicted and drawn, um, very mm, high tech, high yeah. tech. We're talking about machine rooms, engine rooms. Uh, 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 you know, storage spaces, sleeping rooms, uh, cafeterias, multiple floors, and weapons. You know, and vamanas have even been described as as floating cities, and and palaces. And if That's we the coolest part, 
Right, right. Because if we think exactly, Christina, because if we think about this, how many times do we hear uh, a description like mothership, right? Mothership, a giant, you know, these giant. Um, I had a, a guest on Fade to Black many, many years ago. He's a friend of mine. Um, that stayed private for years until he spoke to me after listening uh, to the show and he reached out. And he was in downtown Los Angeles and looked up and saw this thing in the clouds. He was with a co-worker and he described it as a miles wide, upside down aircraft carrier. He said it was a giant city and you could see the lights on the side of it and it was moving in another direction. And he said, then it, it just phased out, right? Like it was seen for a second and then gone. It fundamentally changed him and, and his life only one sighting, but it, it doesn't that sound very similar to, to Vamanas and motherships and, and, you know, other accounts throughout history. They do. So I think there's something to it. I, I agree with you. Nature Cam said, no, I meant that the silver shield that he described was a Vimana. Um, okay. okay. Nature Cam, five minute timeout. Okay. Let's, let's go back. <laughs> we need to stay focused. We have so much to cover and this is incredibly exciting. This is such a cool topic. Nature, nature Cam. Awesome questions though. Awesome. Be because listen, questions like that need to be answered and we can go right off the subject of the show and into that for the next 90 minutes. I don't have a problem doing that, but we've prepared other material. A lot of pages of notes going here. Okay, uh, let's go to, man, already. I know. We're almost, okay, uh, please tell me mm. you've got an image of Nuremberg. I do. Yeah, I know you do. Can you pop that up there? I sure can. Just for me. I mean, yes, this is sir. like looking at a picture of a 1958 Les Paul flame top. Now I don't uh, understand that reference. Uh, I have one over there. It's 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 in front of me. I can't go and get it otherwise. Those aren't flame tops over there. Okay. Um Christina? Yes. When you see this, uh -huh. and let's let, let's light up the chat. All right. We can see the city below. Okay? There's the city, the church steeples, the homes, the restaurants, the village right? The farmland, right? Clearly depicted. What is going on in that sky? What, what goes through your mind? And let's pop that into the chat. What are you seeing? If, if I knew nothing about the topic, I would state that the artist was having creative freedom here with like a happy looking sun and a bunch of like orbs and bars and crosses i'm like okay uh, this is this means something and it's not as straightforward as i would assume it to be but turns out this is incredibly straightforward minus the happy sun all right, all right. that sun doesn't look too happy <laughs> well, I don't think a smiley face it's kind of more of like yeah. really you guys are doing this right now right in front of me exactly exactly um uh it, wow right it, it's pretty wild and and the account is even more wild because this didn't only take place in germany but a very similar encounter happened five years later in switzerland but for those that aren't familiar with this case it's a very famous one let's kind of give them a, a little description of what it's about do you want to tell them or shall i it was a it was a battle it was That's opposing right. forces it was 1961 multiple if, if, let's we'll get back to that date in a second because isn't that incredible right but the uh it was so important this is what they call a woodcut all right now so back then there were different uh ways uh to uh, reproduce art right Okay, so you paint something, but that's it. It's just a painting. How do you reproduce it multiple times? Well, one of those processes, and there was a few uh, that were in play, um, but one of them was a woodcut, uh, which I have uh, personally done in art school. Okay, I've made woodcuts and 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 done my own printing. Um, uh, 
I almost went sideways with that. Oh, a woodcut, the reason why to me it's 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 so impressive, takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. So to do the woodcut, it is an important time in history. You are, it's the news, right? Today we have the internet. Back then, woodcuts. And that's what this is here. There were a few woodcuts made of this event. There wasn't just one. There was a few. Um, this is the one that we see most often. But so the woodcut, you've got a blank piece of wood. You've got a chisel, right, basically. And you're cutting out and removing the wood and, and leaving an image in relief behind. You flip that over, dip it in ink, press it on a piece of paper, and then you move on and, and you can repeat it. That's what this is here. This is a newspaper in Nuremberg with this. They didn't have a camera, but they had a woodcut um, uh, duplicating what was seen in the skies. So that's a woodcut. That's what this is. And this was the internet in Nuremberg back then preserving this event in the skies. All right. Now let's take it one step further. If we go and uh, look at the accounts that were written, there were multiple types of ships in the sky, multiple, multiple shooting at each other in a battle. This was a battle in the skies. And so we see here, we see the, the circular craft. Um, I love the, the four-way cross craft uh, that is here. It's, it's all over. So there was multiple uh, versions of this in the sky. The long cylindrical ones with obviously lights on the side, uh, some light at the top. There's a dome at the top. Um, are these motherships uh, dispersing uh, other craft? Don't know, but that's what's here. Um, the long shaft-like, uh, again, cigar-shaped craft uh, that are here. Um, and it, 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 it's all over the place. And apparently, uh, a lot of this was going on in and around the sun, um, which is emitting uh, its rays of its own. Uh, it's an it's an incredible, incredible piece of historical work. And after some time, the people in the town said that they had heard a major crash outside of the city as well, which is a very interesting detail. But the residents of Nuremberg believed the sky battle was a religious sign, and the event was recorded on a woodcut, a uh, broadsheet by Hans Glasser, who said, Whatever such signs mean, God alone knows. But then, as I had said a little bit earlier, almost the exact same description of this battle that happened in Germany took place five years later in Basel, Switzerland. So at sunrise that day, August 7th, 1566, many large black balls were seen moving at high speed through the air, and they collided with each other as if they were fighting. Many of them turned red before fading from sight. The incident lasted several hours before they disappeared, leaving the, uh, leaving the townsfolk to contemplate what they had just witnessed. And if that were to happen today, I think we would be just as, <laughs> as starstruck as compared to people back then. Now, a hundred percent. And the, uh, so that's the top half of, of the woodcut. Um, the, the black craft, which is, is what is, what it is, what it is depicted here at the bottom is absolutely incredible and menacing. And it's, it's dominant in size. It's, uh, at the bottom of, uh, the battle that is going on above, um, its shape is, again, it's menacing, it's, it's aggressive, it is assertive, and it's also black, and it is giant. It is the biggest craft here. What is that? And before we make comparisons to, you know, Star Wars and some Star Battle Cruiser or, or anything else, um, this is what was seen in the skies. And, and how big was it? Right. It's just it's just an incredible thing. And it's it's not done by accident. And then 
right uh, to the right and below uh, the black dagger shaped uh, ginormous craft, whatever it is, is uh, something happening in the village itself in, in the farmlands out there where um, either some of these craft uh, were shot out of the sky and crashed on the ground or they were possibly shooting at the ground. But there was something that happened in this battle that went from the skies to terra firma and, and planet Earth. That's right. Jimmy, there was one case that we skipped that I would really like to get to, and that took place in Japan in 1235. I'm just going to share an image here as a visual aid. No, this is not the actual image that was seen during this time period, but it looks nice. Okay, so mm. the first known official investigation into a possible alien UFO presence was carried out in Japan in 1235. Here's how it goes. One night, a high officer named General Yuritsumi and his army were settling down in their camp when they spotted mysterious lights in the sky. The general and his troops watched in astonishment as these lights performed amazing movements, such as circling endlessly and flying in loops. Baffled by the bizarre aerial display, the general dis ordered a scientific investigation on what he had just witnessed. The explanation that was given stated that the whole thing is completely natural. It's only the wind making the stars sway. Yeah, yeah, right. This is um, I, I, this was not part of Christina's notes to me, by the way. She caught yeah. me by surprise. But this is one of the best, one of the best documented uh, UFO uh, uh, alien encounter cases in, in history. And you're absolutely right. Ordered a scientific investigation. This image here, um, when you go back and you look at how um, uh, this craft uh, was uh, described, well, obviously we can see a bunch of different things here, but it seems very familiar, right? And if we take this uh, this encounter, which was uh, at 1200 AD, and we look at Japan's origin stories, and, and you jump deep into the historical record, they also describe these exact craft. And um, uh, there are many, many uh, different uh, encounters uh, in Japan uh, throughout millennia. But the origin story itself is a craft came out of the water, and and here we are, right? Which would which would indicate uh, the Japanese people are aliens and and alien hybrids. There's there's that part, and then if we move forward, they have time travel stories, they have inner Earth stories, um, different different depictions of interaction. Uh, with with alien uh, ET ETC extraterrestrial civilizations in Japan, all the way through this one, all describing a craft that looked like had the shape of a turtle, right? And this repeats uh, uh, over and over again in in Japan, all the way through this, which was uh, 1200 AD. Yeah, this this case, uh, I found it really amazing because they were doing what Project Blue Book was doing so many years prior, centuries prior. And just at even at this time in 1235, the scientists were brushing it off as something natural. Now, they didn't say swamp gas. They didn't say it was a weather balloon, but they said that the wind was making the stars sway. And I really like that explanation. While we know that's impossible, uh, I think it's it's a very interesting one. And I'm assuming during that time period, incredibly believable. Well, OK, so the stars swaying part of this uh, goes back. Uh, it wasn't just in Japan. Uh, there were accounts of this throughout the Middle East. Uh, and we go back uh, two, three, four, five thousand years. There were different events uh, and certainly going back to 10,000 uh, B.C., 
uh, where there were events that were going on in the sky where the stars were apparently moving back and forth. Now, what would do this, right? Well, if you were standing still, right, you're, you're, you're not moving and you're looking up and the stars are moving back and forth, then the planet itself is moving. Earth is, is, is doing this and forcing you, which would make the stars appear that they are the ones moving. Mm. And now how do we apply that scientifically? Well, okay. There are different accounts, uh, not only throughout the middle East and, uh, and, and Egypt, but these accounts also go over to China and Japan as well. These events were happening uh, scientifically, we really can't explain it. Um, they don't describe uh, the earth as shaking like an earthquake. They, they, they don't give that. So was the, did the earth stop its rotation momentarily, right? And, and maybe rotate back and forth um, in a very smooth way where you didn't know that it was the earth that was moving. You were assuming that it was the heavens above. These these accounts and these depictions, ah, uh, multiple times, multiple cultures uh, over the last few thousand years. Dang. Should we talk about UFOs over L.A.? It's a pretty famous battle. You want to go there? Do you? Uh, well, what about George Washington? Well, there's an interesting account, but there just wasn't too much information about that one in particular that kind of led to the being ufos but george washington did have a vision in 1777 and he believed that he was being visited by an angel that was a messenger of god for him to win the revolutionary war and there have been some people that have peeled apart his his encounter which was later documented what like in 1787 i believe this is from memory now but People have have pulled it apart, and some think that he had an encounter with extraterrestrials that helped him win the battle. What do you yeah, think about it, that? Well, see, um, uh, when we when we look at this encounter, um, and the first time, the first time that I had read it, and uh, it it forces you to think about uh, other descriptions. Uh, we can go back to Constantine. We can go back to Alexander the Great, right? We can go back to these uh, other historical moments. And Washington uh, wasn't the only person to come back to camp, right? Hanging out with his tents. He's got his cook. The army is preparing. They're sharpening their blades and cleaning their weapons and doing all that. He comes back to camp and goes, hey, so check this out, man. I just had this encounter in the woods with 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 this person, and and they said, "Well, you, you unpack that for a second. This has gone on over and over again throughout history. Now, do we go with um, you know a fairy? Right? <laughs> he met Tinkerbell. Uh, it was a gnome, right? It was a leprechaun, or was it E.T.?" Right? Was it Mother Mary? Was it an angel? Was it? The, let's let's stop for a second and think about what he is trying to say to his troops. He doesn't have a way to go, you know, uh, Zeta Reticuli. So they were telling me, you know, no, he, he he doesn't have that. He doesn't have that mindset. But but I I believe that the encounter happened. Who was it? You know, let's look at you know modern things like Chris Bledsoe. And uh, Fatima, right? And 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 to this day, not only Chris Bledsoe, but but Fatima and other situations like this, you pull away the religious side, and just maybe it's an encounter with a being uh, not of this earth. It's certainly not flesh and blood as as we know it. So I think that George Washington's encounter is important, and we have to align it up with other accounts that are nearly exactly the same. You think about and Constantine, right? The cross, right? When we think about the Knights Templar, right? And the red crosses on their shields, 
we we think about the Knights Templar and their uniforms and their you know and things, and we think about Jerusalem and 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 Europe and and the United Kingdom. That's not where that originated. The crosses on uh, the, uh, the the three boats of Columbus on on the flags. No, that came from Constantine. Constantine and a, and a battle that was going on where he had a vision of a cross, a shape, and that if he applied this cross to his shields, he would de- be he would uh, be defended in battle, right? And and so how how do we apply? It, it's very similar to George Washington and all of these other uh, different events that have happened throughout history. I think they're important. And if he did really have an encounter with angels, we as a community would still define it as extraterrestrials because they're not from this earth. Therefore, they are alien. So I I think that's also an important thing to keep in mind when people have encounters, have it be with majestic beings Mm -hmm. or with angelic beings or with entities such as the greys as well. In, In our kind of how we label things it is alien if it's not from earth well okay so christina okay so yes and 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 we need to really examine your point if you are uh uh, in the military you you right now um uh in, in the distant past and and i need you to understand and to believe and to trust in me, something like this that I need to come back and talk about. Am I going to tell you that it was aliens on a flying saucer? Or am I going to tell you God said, right? You are going to, uh, God said, everybody, it was God. So we need to, and that's that's an application that uh, the military will understand, the people will understand. Rome did this. Rome did this. Uh, uh, if you go back to zero, the year zero, 33 AD, and 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 the Roman wars in in Jerusalem, the Jewish uh, Roman wars. If you go and you look at all of that and how Rome itself tied and established its government with God, right? And, 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 and so you have God, then you have the government, but the government is tied to God. Therefore, God is the government. And if you believe in God, then you believe in the government and then you believe in the military and then you believe in it. It's God said, no matter where the information came from, to be able to do that was something that everybody could understand going fast forward to George Washington. Right, you've got to apply that religious label to it. Otherwise, nobody's going to know what you're talking about. Yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. And and that kind of format, that kind of style, has been used since the beginning. With the, we can look at the Egyptians, the Mayans, the Romans, so on and so forth. It is you have the priests and they are above everyone else because it is believed that the priests have communication with God. And then in Egypt, it was the kings, the pharaohs that were believed to be almost an avatar of God or God himself. So you're right. When you put it in that kind, when you're attempting to explain your idea or your movement, you have to do it in a lingo that everyone can understand and that everyone can be influenced or persuaded. And when you bring in religion during these time periods, that is the easiest way to do it. Because you're right, Jimmy, say aliens. They'll be like, you're absolutely out of your mind. You are whack. But <laughs> they, yeah, I mean, they, they learned their lesson and they said, no, no, that's not the case. Huh? It wasn't aliens. Huh? <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, what? So, um, so uh, Eddie uh, trying to, to, to flame out and start a fire. Is there actually a year zero? Doesn't it go from one piece? Technicality, man. Technicality. Technicality. Night, 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 nice try, though. Doesn't work for me. I say year zero all the time. Why? Why? You understand, right there, year zero, year one, eh, then I got to say it's two years after one BC. It doesn't sound as good. Yeah, year zero. That's my thing. It's the church of woo. Okay. 
Uh, where are we at? Where are we at? George Washington. Okay. Yeah, let's uh, let's do Battle of L.A. Okay, so we've we've briefly covered this case when we did the Mysteries of California. If you haven't seen it, take a look at it. We did a part one and a part two because California is a crazy state. But for those that aren't familiar with this case, Jimmy, you wanna you wanna give us uh, the summary? Coolest thing ever. Coolest. Heck yeah. Thing ever. Well, 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 people died. All right. That now, part's not cool. Okay, so. Um, and, and how, how did they die? Right. They died from panic. They died from, you know, uh, there's a couple of heart attacks, uh, car accidents. Right. Um, I don't think, uh, there was falling shrapnel and, 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 and things that were coming out of the sky. Uh, I don't think that there were any deaths directly connected to that. Uh, but that's not what is important, right? Nobody was shot by alien laser beams, but people were shot because of panic. And this went on all night for hours and hours and hours up and down the coast of California. And if you know anything about this famous shot that we're looking at here, that's in you know Santa Monica. So you uh, you visit Southern California, and we've all seen the beaches. And uh, you go out, that's where people live, all right? Well, we got the rest of Los Angeles, but it's the beach cities, right? Huge population. But it's also something that needs to be protected. And and Japan and the Pacific Theater and World War II was happening at the time. And we were very, very paranoid and, and should have been uh, for the entire West Coast of California, which goes you know, from Washington state all the way down to Southern California um, and, and, and protecting uh, our borders and, and looking to the skies for an eminent, what we thought was going to happen, a Japanese invasion. So we have all the ports, we have the naval facilities, uh, we have the population and we were set up. We had searchlights, we had radar uh, that was going on. We had planes, we had our coastal defenses. We certainly had our Navy and the Army Air Force. Everything was in play up and down the coast of California. We were on full alert. Now, when this started to uh, occur, <clears throat> again, we'll get into the alien part of this in a second, but this didn't just happen with craft. Um, at that time, uh, as, as things started to uh, kick off, we had power outages in, in Los Angeles, massive power outages. And that was an indication of something. We were all, everybody was paranoid, right? We're talking about a world war that was going on, uh, not only in Europe, but Japan and China and what was going on in the, the Pacific theater at that time. And Japan had a huge Navy and a huge Air Force. So we were constantly uh, thinking about the inevitable that we were going to be invaded on, on the West Coast. And Japan was uh, floating um, uh, fire bombs on balloons into uh, the United States in hopes of starting massive forest fires and, and creating havoc. And, and this stuff did occur. So we were looking to the skies. And then on this night, power outages, power outages uh, across Los Angeles. What is going on here? And that was the start of everything. And then as the power outages and we were dealing with that and that paranoia in Los Angeles, this giant craft was seen off of the West Coast and off of Santa Monica. This took place in 1942. And while millions of people had heard all this gunfire, some of them had even seen the craft, it was quickly brushed off almost the next day, stating, no, the military officials, they just had the jitters. They had the nervous jitters. They were scared. They were paranoid because of the Japanese, because Pearl Harbor had just been bombed not too long ago. Um, it, it was believed that there was a already you know, a warning that the Japanese might attack 10 hours um, the next day. So right when this happened of November of February 25th. So there was a lot of panic, like you had mentioned. It was it was happening during this time period. And 
And yet, while there were millions of witnesses, it was so quickly brushed off. And it's kind of unfortunate that a good percentage of people don't actually know this story, Jimmy. This craft, okay. The, the, here's this is the reality of it. This craft moved down the coast um, into Long Beach Harbor. And if you go, uh, it's still there to this day. There's a, a Cherry Hill and Signal Hill in 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 Long Beach uh, in in this area with huge uh, uh, aircraft and cannon batteries on the side of the hill pointing out to the ocean in defense of of the ports that are there. And the crazy part about it is to go uh, from down the coast, this is traveling south from Santa Monica all the way down to Long Beach, and the entire way, searchlights, it's being watched, it's being observed, and it's being shot at, right? Now, they weren't shooting at ghosts. Right? They weren't shooting at nothing. They had searchlights on it. And a total of uh, over 1,200 rounds of anti-aircraft uh, guns and, and weapons were shot at this. 1,200 rounds. And I'm not talking about the small arms fire and the machine guns and the, the other things that were being shot at this, but 1,200 rounds of anti-aircraft fire. Now, I want uh, you to stop and think. I'm talking about the audience. I want you to stop and think what it would be like in your town, in your city, to go through eight hours, 1,200 rounds of cannon fire all night long. <laughs> all night. All right? And they didn't bring it down. If it was a balloon, Japanese balloon, it would have been brought down. We would have seen it. If it would have been anything else, it, it's hard to describe because it was traveling so slow in the air, right? This wasn't a fast aircraft. It was right there and it was being tracked for miles going down the coastline and being shot at. Nothing, no debris, nothing, nothing, nothing fell into the ocean. You know how many boats were underneath it? You know how many searchlights? You know how much, how much was applied to this craft? They were watching it in the sky at very low altitude, by the way. You can triangulate with that, uh, with the searchlights focusing on this. Just a, it's just a thousand feet in the air. It's right there. Everybody saw it. And during that same time frame, pilots were seeing Foo Fighters as well, which at this time, Foo Fighters was a term used by military pilots to describe UFOs, not the band. Okay, just okay. I really need to emphasize now that. that. Was, see, that was to the curb. And where's your beanie? I'm not wearing it today. I washed my hair. So did I. Mine's still wet. Okay, the um, uh, this is a. I like your segue here, and it, it's important to uh, uh, point out some things here. Uh, that the Foo Fighters, um, and uh, you know what? Let me. I'm going to give a, a a little plug. Uh, everybody should go and read uh, Richard Dolan's book, UFOs in the National Security State, Volume One. And, you know, both, but in volume one, because Richard, uh, his section on, on the Foo Fighters and, and some of these other events that we're talking about, by the way, um, <clears throat> his, his information about the Foo Fighters is, is so comprehensive. And, and we read and we see, you know, we see a, a few photographs and, and we hear people comment about the Foo Fighters. There was a lot more going on here than just, you know, these balls of light, these Foo Fighters were, uh, you know, seen over Europe. No, it was something that went on. It was of grave concern uh, to all of Europe um, that went on after the war, too, as well with the ghost ships. Uh, and the and the ghost missiles that were uh, all over. Now, if we look here, okay, so uh, the the Foo Fighters didn't only happen uh, in Europe during World War II. They also were seen in multiple uh, hundreds of times 
in the Pacific Theater in around uh, Japan uh, during World War II. Now, the question arises of, uh, well, the first thing, what were they? Who were they? But there wasn't, there doesn't appear if they were weapons that they ever did anything, right? They never shot at our craft. They didn't shoot at German stuff either, right? Um, they, they appeared to just be watching, observing, tailing, following, hanging out, right? And, that's, and, and, and nobody knows why or where they came from. And the uh, if we take, and I like Richard Dolan's point uh, about this, if we take the description of what a Foo Fighter is, which is a glowing orb, by the way, right? If we take that idea and then we apply that back to the historical records, Foo Fighters have been with us for millennia, and they're still here today. We just don't know what they are. And while there may be a handful of UFO sightings where these crafts don't really interact with people, but like you said, kind of observing or tailing them, there are a few accounts where these craft really get involved in battles or even during like missile practices. And we've covered this on UFOs and nukes where there have been a few accounts we even had. Um, Robert Salas on the show a while back where he talked about his encounter in Maelstrom, Montana. Tell us that story to kind of give people a comparison of when UFOs interact with yeah. war and when they kind of don't. And in this case with uh, the Maelstrom base, this was th these were practice missiles. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. They weren't all practice. I'm, I, I'm not throwing But it was like, it was like during a, like a, like a, a day of practice. It wasn't well, actually they, happening when they, there was war. They were, they were doing drills every single day. Yes. So it was during a drill. Yes. Okay. But the missiles themselves, those were very, those are, those were nuclear missiles. Um, and the, the, so much to unpack with that case, but let me just say this in the time that we have here. It wasn't when when Robert Salas, who I just saw a couple of weeks ago, man, and 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 got to say hello and shake his hand, such a great guy. Um, when Robert Salas came above deck and you know out of the missile silo because one of uh, uh, the Air Force personnel was injured, right, and so they they brought in a helicopter and flew him out. Um, not sure about the injury, not going to get into that, but he came up and was, was, and, and so the other, uh, sentries, the other, uh, service members, uh, that were, uh, above ground came up and said, dude, there's another one down at Charlie or, you know, whatever these installations were called, maybe his was Charlie. Uh, there's another one. What? Another one. What? What are you talking about? And that's what they describe a ball of light over the entrance. Now, as this description was going down, I'm going to go to uh, something even more specific uh, back in World War II with the Foo Fighters uh, interacting, is that it was at that moment that the missiles were taken offline. Pop, 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 pop where you go from green to red, right? <laughs> the, the light, uh, you know. And so back then, these missiles were hardwired, Christina. Hardwired. You had a wire coming. They, you didn't have this multiple huge software system and a central thing. And no, no, we're talking about switches uh, that were flipped in a hardwire uh, setup. So for one to be taken off, that's independent of everything else. So to go in and bring them all offline, they were specifically taken offline. You didn't just take off the system. The rockets were, the missiles were taken off one at a time. And that happened uh, And when Robert uh, was told this, that there was a second ball of light over another installation and there were concerns there. And then suddenly at that moment, 
these missiles are taken offline. It was extraordinary. So, yes, that's when you it wasn't an offensive thing, but it was definitely showing some type of intelligence was interacting. Now, uh, and to that point, let's go back to World War II. Uh, uh, there was a very, very specific report uh, that was filed. Oh, by the way, so uh, back to Malmstrom. When all of this happened, uh, the uh, the Air Force came in and, and did their uh, investigations and, uh, you know, to how this happened. And they just said, it was a mechanical malfunction, right? Oh, they're all taken offline, all independently, one at a time, the same malfunction. You can have it happen in one missile, short circuit, bad wire, whatever it is, uh, poor maintenance. Okay, all right. But then uh, to have them all taken off uh, line one after another, that's not a mechanical malfunction. There was something else going on. So back to World War II. So uh, uh, we had a, a, a fleet of bombers and uh, going uh, uh, flying over Germany, and the tail gunner, and this is from the official reports with uh, with at that time wasn't the Air Force or the Army, the Army Air Corps. Um, it, this tail gunner says, "Hey, we've got a ball of light following us." So they go, and it's right off the rear of the aircraft. He's a tail gunner. And so they raise their altitude. The light follows. and it, 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 Then it got closer. They went down. It followed, went to the other side of the craft. Now the, the entire crew is looking uh, to the rear of the craft, uh, the rear of the bomber, watching this craft follow the bomber. Right. And the pilot says, dude, start shooting. So he starts firing on this Foo Fighter. And the Foo Fighter, um, you have trace, trace ammunition, uh, tracer bullets. So you can see where you're shooting. And this Foo Fighter was avoiding the shots. <laughs> they gave up. Now what do, what does that tell you? Is that under intelligent control? Don't know. What was what was it doing? Don't, we don't know. But the event itself was real. And uh we we never uh, this overlapped by the way um after World War II ended the Foo Fighters continued and uh went into the uh, ghost ships and the ghost rockets that were seen all over Europe and uh, Russia had the same reports. Uh, we talk about Sweden and we talk about Finland, uh, but they were they were seen as far south as Switzerland and Italy, um, and this continued for a couple of years after World War II. It's uh, these are really odd encounters, and we need to go back into the main question of the show: Why are UFOs being seen during war? zone areas because why do, think, why do you think that is well he, as as you had made mention about uh maelstrom montana that took place in 1967 and we're looking at these foo fighters that took place in world war ii the 1940s sometimes they're interacting with people sometimes they're not there have been a lot of questions because uh, i read this one comment here today that said ufos are seen during historical events so it makes you question there's this new theory that a lot of people in the field are looking at could ufos be humans from the future or do they have an interest that we simply just do not destroy ourselves to where they'll deactivate nukes because we, we've seen this in maelstrom we've seen this in vandenberg california in 1964 um we've even seen it in uh ukraine in 1982 in that case is uh, incredibly comical if uh, I really recommend for those listening and watching to take a look at the episode we did on UFOs and nukes, we go into detail on a lot of these cases. But for myself, what do I think? It's really hard to say. Why do they care? 
if at all? Or why are they observing? What's the purpose? Is it documentation? Are they historians themselves to where they are documenting humanity as they go along? Are they humans from the future? Are they, in some aspects, Black projects of some kind? Now, if we go to Alexander the Great, it'll be really hard to say it's a Black project. But I guess in more modern times, that is a possibility. So this is really why I wanted to cover and do this topic for today's show, because I don't have the answers. But what we can do together, Jibby, is is put all the pieces together and somehow in some way formulate an opinion at, at the very least, because we for darn sure are not going to have a conclusion by the end of today's show or in 10 years time. The, uh, your point is, is, is something that we always must think about. If we, if we are looking for ET, trying to make contact, Obviously, we've all seen things, I've seen things, and E.T. is here. But let's, in a general sense, if that's what we are doing, it, we have to uh, assume a few things. That if E.T. is thriving and advancing as a civilization, what they must have overcome is where we are right now. Right, We have to overcome this period of our history. We have to. We have the ability right now in the blink of an eye to kill ourselves. Right, And therefore, we, we won't be a civilization in, in 10,000 years to, to hang out with our, with our ET brothers and sisters throughout the universe. Because we blasted ourselves out of existence. And so we have to overcome this part of our history. And for E.T. to be out there, to have the, uh, the technical skills to visit this planet in an interstellar uh, uh, situation, for that to happen, they had to have overcome this period in their history. And so would they be interested in that? Absolutely. We have to move on and, and get past this, where this threat isn't hanging over our heads. In, in 1963, if we back up, 1963, and we go back to the atmosphere of the world, you know, uh, moving past the Cuban Missile Crisis, right, and we think about at that moment, right, we freak out over Ukraine right now. And we freak out these these statements that are being made by Putin and, and the use of nuclear weapons. You go back to that period, 1962, 1963, in the Cold War, and we were at that moment. So what was the mindset of the world, right, where we could just kill ourselves, we have to move past this part of our history. And for any uh, ET civilization out there anywhere in our Milky Way or throughout the universe that has the ability that uh, to, to go and visit the stars, they move past this moment in history. Now, there are other things that we have to overcome. We have to, to advance to that point. We have to survive... Uh, uh, an asteroid impact, right? We have to survive that. We are hopefully uh, a comet's not going to to hit our planet. Hopefully, we're not going to have some crazy uh, uh, EMF solar storm burped out of our sun and and blast away our atmosphere, um, like you know what happened to Mars. Uh, we have to overcome stuff like that. We have to overcome the disease. We have to overcome a natural disaster like. Uh, a massive uh, earthquake or tsunamis or, or something else that would happen here. We have to overcome all of that to advance. But you know what we are in control of? Those are things we're not in control of. We have to overcome an ET invasion, right? <laughs> an alien attack. We have to overcome all of that. But the one thing we're in control of is killing ourselves, right? So we have to move past that. It's the one fundamental thing that we are in control of.
And ET would absolutely be interested in that. What level are we at? Right? Uh, swords and spears and, and bows and arrows and chariots of the past. We're not going to wipe out the planet with that. We tried, but we certainly can with nuclear weapons. And, and they know that that's where we are today. So for us to advance, we have to move past this. Everything else, we got to deal with later. That's not in our control, right? That's not in our control. But It's, but, it's not on our list of things to do. But war, <laughs> it, it better be. But war is something that um, uh, we need to move past. And we've seen war time and time again, and UFOs have been seen time and time again with a lot of these wars. We saw them in World War One, World War Two, even in the Korean War, which took place in the 1950s, the Vietnam War as well. So let's let's talk about the Korean War that took place in 1950 in the 1950s. Matt, thank you so much for the super chat. It says ETs are here to solve all of the hard problems that plague us today. What do cats think? How do girls shave the back of their legs? Why are bandanas strange? These Ban are interest bananas. <laughs> Ba bandanas, ban <laughs> also bandanas, bananas but bananas are, are delicious. I I love banana smoothies, so good. Banana taffy, kind of kind of good. But yeah, these these are. I mean, what do cats think? That's a really important question that I want to know the answers to. And the only thought should be, I think Christina is great. That should be the only thought that That's cats have thing. yeah i think cats cats are right there uh, yeah the, the, i mean cats are low-key alien we've we've heard this argument time and time again but looking at the korean war we don't have too much time left so in may of 1951 one year into the korean war pfc francis p wall and his regiment found themselves stationed about 60 miles north of seoul and as they prepared to bombard a nearby village um, all of a sudden, the soldiers saw a strange sight up in the hill, and they described it as a type of jack-o'-lantern, and it came floating down across the mountain. As these men watched this craft come down into the village, they began to shoot at it, right? Because that that is humanity's first instinct. If you don't know what it is, you're going to shoot at it. And while they were doing this, the the craft remained unharmed, which we see time and time again. We saw it with the Foo Fighters. We saw it with all the previous wars, and we're seeing it again in 1951. Suddenly, the object turned, and whereas at first it had glowed orange, it was now pulsating blue, green, very brilliant type of light. He asked his company commander for permission to fire at the object with armor piercing bullets, meaning mm -hmm. a lot stronger bullets than what they were previously using. And the when the bullets hit the body of the craft, he recalled, they made this metallic ding sound and the object started behaving still more erratically moving from side to side as its lights flashed on and off. So that makes you question, did somehow those particular bullets uh, affect this craft or was it supposed to do that on its own before it got shot? These are the questions that, that they were probably asking as well during this time. But what was even more interesting was that Wall stated we were attacked and swept by some form of a ray that was emitted in pulses and waves that could visually see only when it was aiming directly at you. Right. That is to say, like a searchlight sweeps around and the segment of light, you would see it coming at you. He remembered a burning, tingling sensation sweeping over his body as if he was being penetrated by this light. The men rushed into the underground bunkers and people through the windows, watching as the craft hovered above them and then shot off at a 45 degree angle. Wall said, that was quick. And then it quickly vanished. So in this encounter, we're looking at a more modern war, and yet they are still dealing with UFOs and they don't know how to handle the situation. It is not taught in the military handbook. It should be. 
This this um, this event. Uh, okay, let, let, let me let me help everybody understand. First off, this went on for days. Uh, this wasn't uh, a single thing. One, number two, it was in a valley, so they were up on the hill. On the other side were also American forces. On the other side, this this action was happening through the valley, and they were shooting at this craft uh, from both sides. Um, the reporting of this is pretty definitive. Um, there isn't a whole lot of speculation here. They knew that this wasn't a Chinese craft, a North Korean craft. They they knew that. They knew that it wasn't uh, any technology that we had at the time. Um, they were completely paranoid, completely freaked out. Um, it was something that they didn't have uh, any, it, it, they didn't have any way to deal with it. And the American forces were out of their minds. And th they're communicating with each other from both sides of this valley. They're all talking about it. They're all watching this crap. They're all shooting at it. And, and nothing was happening. And it totally messed with them. And uh, uh, I think, um, I, I almost want to say cat and mouse, but we said cat and mouse. Uh, we mentioned cats earlier. But this is kind of what was going on where the the armed forces uh, from the United States had no defense. They had no control over this uh, in this valley uh, for a number of days. Uh, totally frightening. And the um, the other descriptions of uh, of the the beams, and this always had my attention over the years, that you couldn't see it until it was pointed at you, right? How... How scary is that, right? So what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you going to go out there and look at it? No, dude, you're going to hide. You know, can you imagine, right, where you're hunkered down in bunkers um, knowing that there's a craft outside, you know, flying over, waiting, just waiting for you to pop your head out? <laughs> oh, no, you're you're, you're going to bob and weave. Well, three days... <laughs> Three days after the incident, the entire company of men was evacuated by ambulance. And when they were treated, the doctors had noticed that they had extremely high white blood cell count. So Richard F. Haynes, a UFO researcher and former NASA scientist, said they had symptoms that sounded like the effects of radiation. Yep. We've also seen this time again, time and time again, with people that have encounters with UFO craft, either by touching it or being or having a, a beam of light shine on them. They get some form of radiation. Why do you think that is, Jimmy? I don't know. Don't know. Well, the um, uh, what we know uh, about lasers and and those types of energy weapons, uh, some or all have some f uh, form of radiation to it. Sunlight has radiation in it, right? Okay, so the, there's that part of it. But uh, when you're when you have a, a directed beam uh, pointed at you. Some is going to have a a, a a dose of radiation that would be extreme. Some some less. Like you know, you get a sunburn. That's radiation, right? So you're out in the sunlight. Um, so, but it would indicate that if you had some of uh, these soldiers that weren't radiated, then they didn't have uh, a, a a beam pointed specifically at them, right? So you have some that aren't. Some that are, that would say, that would show us that there was a weapon being used and, and pointed at these soldiers. And that's there isn't another way to, to draw anything from this. Um, I wanted to say uh, this. You made, a, you made a point earlier um, that they could hear the bullets, right, bouncing off of this craft. So now we're dealing with something that's physical, something that's real. And I had a, a sighting. I was with... You know, hundred the the green chrome ball sighting. I've got hundreds of people around me, and with with uh, within this group, there were a lot of those high energy, high powered military grade lasers that 
that we use uh, when you're out doing a sky watch, you're pointing a craft. And in some cases, it's miles away, right? And you need to have a powerful laser to point up at the sky, right? Okay. So while I am looking, Christina, I'm looking at this craft and I can see it. It's a green chrome ball and I'm following it. The, is it, is it, is it just a ball of light? Right? Is it just a ball of energy? I don't know. I'm just looking at it. It looks like there's some kind of reflective side on it. I've always described it as a green chrome ball. Until this happened, I would see everybody's pointing. You know, there's four, five, six, seven, eight lasers that are trying to point at this craft as it's flying through the sky. And I would see the laser cross the craft. Right, it's zigzagging, or you know, and and when it did, it sparkled. Right, and I and I saw this happen over. That's what. It's a physical craft, right? This isn't a ball of light, a ball of energy where the laser would pass through it. You, you understand what I'm saying? It instead it sparkled, and it was nuts to see. And, and my heart, when you go from, you know, a harmless ball of light, right, a harmless ball of energy, which is cool, it's great, it's great, to a freaking physical craft where these lasers are bouncing off of it. Yeah, and that's when you take the step from a spirit energy, some kind of ball of energy, some kind of thing, an orb of light, and which is all cool, to an actual physical craft that is going across and then and ascending up, which eventually, after five minutes, uh, you know, became a star in the sky and and flew away. But for those few minutes, as it was uh, going across the desert floor and started to turn up, and everybody's pointing these lasers on it. I saw that it was a it was a physical craft, and these lasers were bouncing off of it. Just imagine that, right? These bursts of sparkles. That's crazy. Yeah, it was nuts. It was nuts. Which is the same thing that happens to those soldiers, right? The uh, U.S. Armed Forces in Korea, when you're shooting at this thing, and it's one thing when you're shooting at it, and you don't know what's going on, and then you hear it go tink. Right, and you know that you're shooting at something that is actually physical in front of you. That's a whole nother situation. It is weird, uh, Jimmy. Can you read this very nice super chat from Nature Cam? Uh, Jimmy, you look ten years. <laughs> you're gonna make me. You you look ten years younger wearing the beanie. A generic version of Silent Bob. Congrats on all of the years of broadcasting. Thank you, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm to the curve. Nature Cam. To the curb. You can now say that because you're wearing the beanie. Um, Brian, thank you so much. It says, could they be made of silver? It's the most conductive of electricity and heat. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always think the, okay. Do we consider that it's of materials that we understand. This is true. Titanium, steel, aluminum, right? Silver, gold. You know, do, do we consider that? Or uh, are there metallic materials that are different out there than here? Yeah, I would say that that, that would be true. Right. That, 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 you know, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a PhD and, and I don't understand these things. Um, yeah. Daniel Guzman, uh, metamaterials, um, to, to look at this and the combination of different materials and how, you, you know, you force them together, you know, certainly, you know, bronze and copper and, and adding nickel and, and these things, you know, hard to make a different material. Of course, steel, stainless steel is not steel, right? There's additives to it. So uh, is that something to think about? It would have to be uh, considered. Uh, I, I don't I don't know enough about it, but if uh, if we are in possession of an alien craft on this planet and we are, uh, we know 
that the material that is uh, is used is not something that was made here. It's made it's made elsewhere. I guess we won't know until we collect some evidence. Well, we'll do that in your RV. Heck are you, yeah. Are you going to have a cat? I are have you, Puck. I, no, are you going to have an RV cat? That I have Puck. He's no, going to be Puck. If you think Puck is a living thing, we have to talk. <laughs> you didn't hear anything. Christina, Puck thank you so thing. much. It's our 6th our six, our ninth anniversary tonight on Fade to Black, and and uh, I'm going to do it with Jim Harold. It's, uh, it's nice. Kind of yeah, he's great. So Love that's Jim. tonight. I'm going to get out of here, take this beanie off, so I can think properly and uh, get ready it's for the show the tonight. New thinking cap. Y- you'll you'll think better with it on. I like the tag. I like this. I like the it tag. is it is to the curb, as nice. you say. Thank you so much, Christina. Everybody, I'll see you tonight on the show. You're the best. Bye. What a fantastic show today. We looked at UFOs and all the times that they have been in and around war zone areas. Out of all the cases that we covered today, which one was your favorite? I think for myself, I I do really like the case with Robert Salas in Maelstrom, Montana in the 1960s. That case blows my mind every single time. But I was pretty shocked with Alexander the Great having a UFO sighting. I was like, what? That is wild. But out of all the ones that you heard, Which one was your favorite? I would like to mention that tomorrow on Weekly Strange News, it is going to be our monthly roundtable with Jimmy Church and Micah Hanks of the Debrief Media. You do not want to miss that. Why? Because they don't know this. It's between you and me. But we're going to play a trivia game. Oh, there's Jimmy. No, he's not supposed to be here. We're going to play a trivia game and then get into some weekly strange news. I'm really excited to see out of the two, which one is going to win. That is it for today's show. I'll see you tomorrow. Be safe. And remember, keep your eyes on the skies.